everyone. Welcome to North Coast Church Online. My name is Al and what a crazy week it's been, right? We were looking forward to seeing some of our friends. We were looking forward to having growth group. We were looking forward to serve, but everything's been turned upside down in a moment. But as Christians, we have something that gets us through it all. Uh, it's something that's been getting Christians through for thousands of years. And Peter writes this to Christians who have a tough. So l- listen to what 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 has to say. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living Hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, we have a hope. It's a living hope because our hope is a living person. Jesus, who's been resurrected from the dead. And today we'll be looking at a conversation Jesus had with his disciples about following him. And if you're new to North Coast or you want to know more about us or about Jesus and want to connect with us, please head to the website, click on the I'm new tab and then connect with us. We would love to hear from you. And if you're looking for North Coast Kids, just head to the YouTube channel. It's all there. There's a video for our preschoolers and a sheet to download for all our school age kids. Now, before we hear from Steve, let's just pray to God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven. Thank you so much for Jesus, for the living hope that you have given us through him. Every time we enter lockdown or have some sort of restriction, it feels like so much has been taken from us. But Father, help us remember all the benefits that we have in Jesus, the benefits that no one can take away. Help us to get our hope from Jesus. And we are constantly flooded with bad news, like this last week, like the bushfires. Father, we ask that you would comfort people. Comfort those who have suffered this week. Comfort those who have lost this week. Thank you so much for our emergency response teams who put their lives at risk for others. And Father, as we hear from Steve, as he unpacks the word now, help us to pay careful attention to what you have to say. May we embrace your word where it cuts us. May we let it change us and define us. May you comfort us through your word. Please, Father, we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hello, North Coast Church. It's great to be with you, even if it is from lockdown. Uh, We can't get together again. It's Steve McAlpine here. Last week I started uh, doing some work for North Coast Church, had my first Sunday with you, and now here we are in lockdown. But the good news is, of course, that God's Word is not locked down. Paul in prison, writing to Timothy, in 2 Timothy says, uh, even though he's in chains for the Gospel, the Word of God is not chained. God's Word is not in lockdown. The Gospel will transform and change us, even in difficult situations. And then Paul writing to the Colossian church, uh, even though he's still in chains in prison, he says, the word of God is advancing and bearing fruit everywhere. Uh, Today was supposed to be our advanced Sunday, uh, and we're thinking, oh, we're going backwards. But no, we're reminded even in difficult circumstances, the word of God advances and it bears fruit for the gospel. And that's what we're praying that it will do for us, that it will bear fruit for the gospel in our lives as we hear it. Uh, So I want you to be encouraged by that. Uh, One other thing before we uh, look at our final in the served series uh, today is that next week we start a series on uh, the first 17 chapters of the book of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament. It's called The King's Gambit. And we're going to be looking at the big picture of God working sovereignly in a world where there's so much chaos and disorder. And what that means for you, what that means for us as a church, what that means for our world. So that's next week, uh, 1 Samuel, the King's Gambit. But I'm going to pray for us. And then wherever you are in your Jimmy Jams or whatever you're doing at the moment, sitting having a coffee uh, in your lounge room, if you're on your uh, phone or wherever you are, Uh, I want to pray for us, and then we're going to look at this final week in our Served series. Let's pray. Father God, please help us as we hear your word to take it on board and put it into practice and be amazed by how much Jesus has served us. And so, uh, in our response, we would serve others. Amen.
Well, this is our final week of Served, and we're looking at a passage from Mark chapter 10, but we call the series Served -d -d -d, with a D on the end because we recognize that serving can be dangerous if we do it out of the wrong motivations. And what we've looked at over the last few weeks are being lovingly served by Jesus so that we can serve in love, humbly served by Jesus so that we can serve with humility those around us and joyfully served by Jesus so that our service itself will be done uh, joyfully with people and God sees that in our lives. And today we're wrapping it up with we are served in order to serve. It's part of what we're called to do. And we're looking at a famous account in Mark's Gospel and Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem and he's already told his disciples that that's where he's going. He's heading up to Jerusalem where he's going to be crucified and killed and then rise three days later, and they don't quite get what's going on, these disciples. He's spoken of his death often enough, but they don't get it. And in some senses, they're thinking, here's the one who everyone is saying is the Messiah. He's heading to Jerusalem, where the king is usually crowned. Maybe this is his inauguration. Maybe he's speaking figuratively when he says that he's going to be put to death. So there's all sorts of things going around in their minds. But James and John, the sons of Zebedee, it says in verse 35, came up to him and said this, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? Now, think of it a little like this. Uh, James and John are getting in early. Uh, think of the presidential inauguration a few weeks ago of President Joe Biden in the United States. Everyone from his party present a united front. But you can bet your bottom dollar behind the scenes there was pushing for position among many of the people who believed that they should have a role of power when uh, the president uh, came into his kingdom. Everyone wanted, so to speak, to sit on his left hand or his right hand as the Secretary of State or whatever role they wanted. It's a real bun fight. And James and John are no different. But notice what they say, Jesus, can you give us whatever we want? We're going to ask you a question. We want you to do for us what we ask of you. Now, if any of you are parents, you know that is a trap question. <laughs> what you want to ask your kids at that point is, OK, well, that depends. What do you want? And that's exactly what Jesus says. What do you want me to do for you? And have a look at verse 37. And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. What are they asking for there? They're asking to be second in charge. We want the positions of authority around the throne. In the ancient days, there'd be a throne and there'd be a left-hand side and right-hand side in there where the most trusted advisors of the king. They want some of that now. But there's something wrong with the question even to begin with, isn't there? Jesus, we want you to do for us what we want. I don't think that that question has gone away in people's minds. When we think about who God is or who Jesus is, it's very easy to go to Jesus and use him like that. Okay, Jesus, if I'm following you, wherever you're going, I want you to do for me what I want, which for a follower of Jesus is exactly the wrong way round. The question that we should be asking is, Jesus, what do you want from us? What does it mean to follow you as a disciple? What do you want? And as we find out in this passage, what Jesus wants is us to do exactly what he did, to serve. Now I wonder how Jesus felt at that moment. Surprised, saddened, he'd been with them for three years. Three years, the disciples, teaching them. And they still haven't quite grasped what it means to follow him the way he's calling them to. But then again, that's us as well, isn't it, when you think about it. And he's saying, you have no clue. You have no clue. Look at verse 38. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am to be baptized? And they say, yeah, we can do that. We're able to do that. We can do that. We're up for that. No worries, Jesus. We've got that covered. Give us the list of things to do. Baptism whatever that means, or the cup, whatever that means. I'm sure we're onto it. And then we can get some of that good stuff and sit at your right hand and your left hand. In a sense, James and John sound like uh, the expert bloke who's watching the footy on the television, who knows how it should be done. Yeah, I could do that. Who feels that if he was given the chance, he could just nail it. He could get exactly right 
what he's been called to do. But if you put him out there on the park with the professionals, he'd fail. And Jesus is saying exactly that. He's hauling them back. And he goes in verse 39 and 40 is what he says. Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left hand is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. They just don't get what he means by the cup or the baptism. You've all seen the meme, famous now, I suppose, from the Princess Bride movie, uh, where the character says, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. And Jesus is saying to them, oh, you think you know what I mean when I say drink from that cup or be plunged into what I'm going to be plunged into? That's what baptism means. Well, guys, you're in for a shock. And my left hand and my right hand. Let's see, when I get to Jerusalem and the story unfolds, what will the left hand and the right hand side of me look like? It'll look like two crucified robbers on the side of a crucified king. You keep using that word. I do not think you know what it means. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is indeed going to Jerusalem, but the glory that he will experience will be a very different kind of glory. The throne that he will mount will be a very different kind of throne. And those who are on his left hand and his right hand side will be very different to what James and John get. They have journeyed with Jesus for three years and they still don't get it. They still think it's about Jesus doing for them what they want. Not like us, of course. We're far from that, aren't we? <laughs> but let's go on. Let's, let's finish the story because word gets around to the rest of the disciples that James and John have gone in for the, uh, the rich pickings, so to speak. Look at verse 41 with me. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. They're going, oh, how dare they say things, you know, harumph, harumph. That's just, oh, just terrible. And they're all having fainting fits about it. How dare, it's scandalous. What they really mean is, why didn't I get in first? <laughs> they're feeling they've the sour grapes of it all. They haven't been able to get in first before James and John and ask for the good stuff. But see, here's the thing with Jesus. Jesus has got a great way of looking past the external right to the heart. In fact, that's what's so special about Jesus in these stories in the Gospels. He sees past all the stuff that we say on the surface and he gets straight to the heart of the matter. Because what he doesn't say is, okay, you 10, I know you're indignant, I feel it too. Come here, James and John, let's have a little talk over in the corner. No, he gathers them all around them. He gathers the disciples around them because he knows their hearts. And he's going to show them how the kingdom works. And he's going to contrast the kingdom of God with how the kingdom of the world works. He's going to say, here's how the kingdoms of this age work. And then I'm going to contrast it with the kingdom of God. Have a look at verse 42. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Here's the thing. People haven't changed, have they? 2,000 years ago, today, whatever it is, everyone wants to get into the position of being served. When you go to a fancy restaurant, there's nothing quite like being the person who's being served. And when you get to a certain age and you no longer have to be uh, a waiter as a young person going through university or doing the dishes out the back, there's something kind of smarmy about being the people who get to sit down and be served. There's something nice about it. There's something nice about being, oh, you're special, come to the front of the red rope and be led into the club early. And it's not just in politics or business or kings or rulers. It's influencers, socially acceptable types. If you can be the person who's uh, there at the front and always being served and everything given to you, that's you winning. That's winning in our world. When you're the one who can call the shots, if you're the one who can dial room service and someone else is paying for it, and if you're the one who gets the fancy table, that's the goal in life. That's how the world works. There's another great uh, thing that was on the internet. It was a Vine, I think, which Vine has gone by the wayside, where some bloke's driving in a car and he just says, my goal in life is to blow up, blow up and then act like I don't know nobody. 
My goal in life is to blow up and then act like I don't know nobody. I want to get famous enough to have people running after me, to serve me, and then I will ignore the plebs. One of the really sad things about listening to the whole Michael Jordan story, as people have watched the Last Dance series on Netflix, uh, was some of the commentary by people like the equally famous basketballer Charles Barkley, who said that whenever he went out to places with Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods, the golfer, uh, he would follow behind them because he would have to tip the waiters, the valets, the bellhops, all the people that Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods wouldn't even throw a coin to, despite how vastly rich they were. He would go behind them and tidy things up. Both Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods had a view of people that they would lord it over them. And Charles Barkley remembered his past too much, how he came up through the ranks to let that go past. You know what Jesus does here? He flips the Michael Jordan Tiger Woods thing 100%. Look what he says. Not so with you. Verse 43 reads, if you have a look at it, but it shall not be so among you. That's how it starts. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Verse 44. So verse 43 and verse 44, Jesus flips it. And in the original, it literally says, not so among you. Not so among you. There's a pathway to greatness, says Jesus. There's a pathway to being first. And everyone's going, okay, Jesus, tell me what that pathway is. Should I get rid of the negative people in my life? Should I marry condo the house? Should I get rid of that which does not bring me joy or get rid of those who do not bring me joy? What is it? And Jesus nails it here. It's pretty simple. The pathway to greatness, the pathway to being first, be a servant, be a slave of all. And you go, wait, 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 will this be in the exam? I mean, how, how, how do we do that? Jesus is saying your path to greatness is serving. Your trajectory to first is last. You see, and we don't want to hear that. We just don't want to hear that. We know that last week when there was an announcement that we we're going into lockdown, it was a bun fight in Coles <laughs> as you grab the last roll of toilet paper. We're told in our culture, aim for greatness. Don't let people get in your way. And Jesus says, we have to aim for last. We have to aim for a slave of all. How would you do that? And you want to say, well, you first, Jesus, you first. Just don't teach us that stuff. Show us. Which is exactly what Jesus says, which is exactly where Jesus goes next. For the crucial verse is the last verse, verse 45. Have a look at it with me. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let me repeat that verse. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The key word there is the word even. Why is that the key word? Because of who Jesus calls himself in that verse. The Son of Man. The Son of Man. In verse 35, James and John refer to him as teacher. We want you to do for us what we ask. And Jesus refers to himself here as he does so often throughout the Gospels as the Son of Man. And what did he mean by that when he used that term? Was he just saying, I'm a human being? No. In the Old Testament prophetic book of Daniel, in chapter 7, there's an image, a vision that Daniel has of the Ancient of Days, God sitting on the throne, being worshipped by thousands who are serving him. And it says in his vision, he sees one who looks like the Son of Man approaching the throne of this Ancient of Days. And all authority and power is given to this Son of Man. And what it says about the Ancient of Days earlier, everyone serves him, it then says about this Son of Man. There's something about this Son of Man who is able to take the praise of humans in the way that God was 
that's okay. <laughs> Somehow this Son of Man is so spectacularly amazing that God is looking on from the throne, approving of him getting worship, everyone bowing down to him. And Jesus said, even this figure, this person, the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve. The very person who would expect to be able to be served by everyone, to go to the front of every red rope line, to be given every great seat at every great restaurant, serves. And if that is true of the Son of Man, then it has to be true of anyone who follows him who's below him on the food chain. And who is below the Son of Man on the food chain, according to Daniel chapter 7? Everyone. Everyone. Note too the second part of verse 45, to give his life as a ransom for many. To give his life as a ransom for many. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life for, as a ransom for many. But also this, he served by giving his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is heading to Jerusalem to serve. His glory will be the cross. His throne will be the wooden gibbet. His courtiers on his left and his right hand side will be thieves. His role will be to take on sin, our sin. That is how the Son of Man is going to serve, even the Son of Man. Now, I've got to say at this point, the cultural Kool-Aid is addictive. It's not just the business world or the entertainment world or the social online world or the political world where the food chain is acting like the rulers of the Gentiles. I fear that the church too can slip into this kind of way of thinking. And I've spent much time over the years dealing with situations where I see leaders grasping at power or people in church being treated poorly or people trying to climb the church ladder, so to speak, to get the best gigs and operate in the green rooms and uh, rope off areas for Christian celebrities. What have we forgotten if we do that? What have we missed? We've missed this. The path to greatness is serving. The path to first is to be a slave of all. And Jesus did that. But it's also this. Greatness and firstness are not defined by this age, but the next age. Don't serve at church in the hope that you get to move up the food chain or you get to be in charge. Don't serve with the intention of climbing the ladder to a position where you can get others to serve you and your interests. Serve because on the last day, the Son of Man before whom all of the creation will be worshipping and bowing down, will lift you up and say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Jesus served us, even the Son of Man. Even the Son of Man. And in response, how could we not serve him and by extension others who so humbly lovingly and joyfully served us. Let our requests to Jesus be not, we want you to do for us whatever we ask, but rather, we want, you to, we want to do whatever you ask of us. And let that begin with serving. Serving here at North Coast Church, but in other places, in our families, in our work settings, whatever setting we're in. Because we have first been served, even by the Son of Man. Amen. Hopefully see you next week in person.